Hello, welcome to the Center for Khmer Studies second webinar for the Build for People project. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to uh, be the moderator for this session. Um, this is uh, a brief introduction of our participants and then also a bit of a logistics on handling both the presentations and the questions. Our four presenters for today uh, are Dr. Lutz Kachner, uh, Professor uh, Emeritus uh, of, in the Faculty of Architecture and Urban Planning uh, at the University of Kassel in Germany, Dr. Chao Ren, Associate Professor at the University of Hong Kong in the Faculty of Architecture, uh, Dr. Uh, Naida Chin, Department of Economic, uh, Economic Development in the uh, Faculty of Development Studies at the Royal University of Phnom Penh, and Mr. Bunleng Se, Climate Change and Water Group in the Department of Geography and Land Management, a PhD candidate uh, at the Royal University of Phnom Penh, and also I'm delighted to say uh, also a CKS fellow. Uh, we have supported uh, the research. So this um, webinar is about an extraordinarily important topic. I'm sure we're all aware uh, that urban systems are expanding dramatically throughout the world globally, but particularly uh, in Asia. And so the particular theme of this webinar is something quite important on urban climatology, design and policy implications. Um, with respect to the actual organization of the webinar, I will just say that the presentations will uh, last approximately, the four presentations will last approximately one hour, uh, perhaps a little bit less. Uh, and then after that, we will have time approximately 30 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so for those of you who are, uh, are participating on Zoom, uh, we ask that you put your questions into the Q&A box and I will be able to draw from that and direct the questions to our four, four presenters. For those of you uh, live streaming on Facebook, uh, this your questions will be put into the chat and I'll be able to make selections there uh, as well. Uh, so with that, um, I would invite Dr. Lutz Kashner to present the overall project of the Build for People uh, uh, analytical work uh, for ongoing. Uh, and also he will then uh, present uh, the second presenter as well, Dr. Chao Ren. So Dr. Kashner, if you might uh, begin. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, is it possible for you to see my slides? Okay. So, uh, in in the, first of all, good morning. Here I am still in Germany, sitting in my not in my office but in my room and having a cup of coffee in the early morning. For you, it's a bit later. This is fine. Uh, and I want to introduce in the first slide uh, just. Uh, okay, I have to do it like that. Uh, just to see in which frame we are working. So we, we are, the Build of People project is a, is a project which tries to help to understand and to develop uh, sustainable development of neighborhoods, the sustainable development of cities. And in this respect, uh, of course, climate, not only the climate change, but especially the urban climate is one important, important factor. As here, we have problems of, of heat problems, we have flooding, uh, we have ventilation problems. And this has to be analyzed. And if you look to, the, to our consortium, first of all, you see here the, the speakers the, that uh, we are working with the Royal University of Phnom Penh as our partners, and uh, I myself with a colleague Sebastian Kupski in Germany. And today also we have invited uh, Chao Ren from the Hong Kong University, as I work quite a lot with her in the past years in the urban climate maps of Hong Kong. And this is also a tropical area, so it's it's not similar to Phnom Penh from climate, yes, but not from the city design, of course. So what we are doing in, in the Build of People project 
is we have different working packages. This is behavior change so that really people would like uh, to know what is comfort, what is, what is discomfort. Then we have sustainable buildings. How can we use all the potentials around us for having uh, buildings which needs less energy, for example? Then we have uh, urban green, which is important in a city. Urban green for ventilation, for a reduction of heat island, and so on. And our working patches, where I am the leader from, is, is dealing especially with urban climate, which we are focusing today. And all this is coming together uh, in, in a sort of a uh, uh, sustainable urban transformation system so that we can use the different disciplines and to come to the sustainable development of a city. And of course, all this must be coordinated, communicated, especially to the outside. So we're doing a lot of research and uh, trying to bring this to, together and, and do recommendations, lectures, and so on. In, in, the, in the project itself, uh, we had last uh, some weeks ago, we had a workshop and for climate, it was quite important to see how can we recommend uh, the building this design? How can we meant, uh, recommend the, the neighborhood design from the point of climate, in the point of urban climate? And therefore, we, there are two things important. One is, of course, radiation. So we need a lot of shadow. We have to reduce our heat, heat island during day, but also we need nocturnal cooling during night, and we have to, to use ventilation. So these are the important factors. We all know this already from, from many investigations about, around the world, but we have to localize it to Plum Plum. We have to see what, what is that. You will see also in the lecture of, of Chao how this can be done. So in principle, we have the issue of the urban heat island. We need ventilation for the city design, but as well for energy, how to use natural energy in, in, in cities. And we have to study the thermal comfort as a part of quality of life. And uh, in the figures you see one, of course we have the urban heat island and this is will be there, but we have tried to, to solve it somehow. And we must have a development which allows wind to penetrate a city and not a block. This is one important uh, issue which we have to deal with. And this is also can be done uh, by maps and other things. So uh, for me, it's a quite big pleasure uh, to, to, to say, to introduce uh, Chao Ren from the Hong Kong University, because with her, we, we have done a lot of uh, approaches, how you can start such a project. In, in Phnom Penh, we don't have, have up to now a, a citywide map of urban climate, but we have, a, we have installed, you will hear all this later, also this later from uh, instruments, from stations, so we, we know what, what to do in future. And with this, uh, I will hand over to Chao or Ellen, would you like to, to introduce her again? No, that, that's fine, Lutz. I think that's... Okay, uh, this I is think fine. That. So, so only to say from for my side that uh, I, I'm not an architect, by the way, so I'm a meteorologist, as you said from the beginning. But Chao is an architect and she's able really to, uh, to understand climate and to bring it to recommendations to planning. So Chao, it's a pleasure for me to let you start, please. Uh, thank you, Luz. Can you, can you all see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for Luz and also Alan's uh, introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our Hong Kong uh, and also some other re relevant countries or cities is kind of uh, climate application experience. Uh, so, you know, that today's um, topics relevant to the talk about urban climate and changing climate. So I'd like to share our real practical experience, how we really change the design and also uh, tailor-made this kind of design for changing climate. 
in Asian cities. Um, so I guess Luz already gave you a very brief introduction about urban climate and why it's important. Uh, I guess you can see from here, the every city is different for the, especially for the subtropical climate, optimizing the city environment for human summer comfort in summer months and providing urban air ventilation are essential uh, considerations for planners. Um, if you already have a specific site and then uh, you can easily uh, to collect information like the city climate, um, what is a specific time season situation, the local weather uh, data, um, but as a planner and architect, what you can change or influence such kind of urban climate condition, you can change uh, by uh, update or uh, redesign the city form and city size, the density of land uses, and also you can choose uh, the right energy uh, consumption mode, uh, the waste management, uh, et cetera. So uh, as an architect or planner, you can really change the climate uh, through this kind of city metabolism, city size and city form. And uh, very often people may ask a question why we need to consider urban climate into the planning. Uh, normally there are two purpose. One is to improve the summer comfort situation, mitigate urban heat island. The second one is to uh, improve the wind dynamic situation, i.e. improve the wind uh, ventilation at the pedestrian level to make the pedestrian level more comfortable and livable. And when we talk about a design strategy, uh, normally focus on the four aspects, changing the albedo, uh, planting more trees, vegetations, for white shading at the pedestrian level and improving the ventilation. And for every detailed planning at, uh, actions, you can see from here, it also corresponds to the different time scale and spatial scale. So for example, if we paint all the buildings into the white, or we choose uh, have albedo, this kind of materials for entire city's building, then we can get immediate, uh, this kind of surface level intervention and the whole effect could be at the city level. However, if we change, just provide a shading or change the building ground cover, the building uh, box, and is the effect is very local. And however, the, the time scale could be uh, stay quite long, like the city, city years, uh, 30 years or 50 years. Uh, so every time when we provide a suggestion, a recommendation to planners, we ask them to consider the corresponding the time scale and spatial scale so they can choose the proper uh, plan and design actions which can fit to their, their site situation. Uh, in Hong Kong, um, actually we conduct a urban climate map study for Hong Kong uh, back to the 2006 to 2012. Um, by that time, I was a PhD student. Luz is our uh, overseas expert. And you know, the urban climate map is uh, originally developed by the German people. And Luz is one of the godfathers. So we learn a lot from Luz. And so if you're interested, you can go to the uh, planning uh, department's website, and this is a link, and there is a full report, full document, you can get everything uh, from our project. And in Hong Kong, why we need to start this kind of urban climate map, um, because uh, Hong Kong's climate is belong to subtropical. If you have ever chance to visit our city, you can see uh, definitely this is a high density city. Uh, we are full of the concrete jungles. And uh, especially in the summer, this kind of urban heat island effect intensified because of the compact urban settings. Uh, and also limit greenery in the urban areas. So that is why if you walk around in the city areas or downtown areas, you always experience extremely hot or discomfort situation. And this is also shown by our weather record. You can see um, the accelerating increase in the urban temperature and deteriorating the urban wind situation. And especially the bottom one, uh, the one line station, Allen, uh, they show there's no significant trend in the urban wind situation. However, our downtown uh, weather station data show that uh, there is a decrease uh, wind speed ratio. Every uh, per second, we have decreased uh, 0 0.6 meter per second. So if we combine the wind and temperature situation, definitely in the summer, the discomfort situation will get more and more. 
And according to the energy consumption situation, because of the urban heat island, and uh, you can see if we uh, reach this kind of temperature raised by three degrees uh, Celsius, and the domestic energy consumption will be increased by 30%. And uh, commercial will be around 10%, industry will be uh, 9%, and total will be the 14, uh, nearly uh, 15%. So i.e. Uh, just a, a few degree uh, temperature change, but the potential impact could be the huge. And in Hong Kong, um, before we conduct this urban climate map study, uh, we never saw Hong Kong's wind environment is so complex. Um, you can see from the bottom um, wing rose diagram. This is uh, different wing roses we selected from the different Hong Kong local weather stations. And the uh, prevailing wing directions is really complex because Hong Kong 78% uh, area is uh, hilly. So that is um, dominant by this kind of uh, hilly wing situations. And also uh, co considering the urban heat island effect, uh, the overall, the urban climate condi con con uh, condition in Hong Kong is really complicated. And um, in the planning department, uh, the first study talk about uh, urban climate is uh, two in 2005, uh, we complete the feasibility study on established air ventilation assessment. Um, because in Hong Kong, uh, in 2003, we have SARS and SARS is like today's uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Um, so the local government is really worried about the in environment hygiene issue and how to uh, create a high quality living situation for our citizens. So by that time, um, we already consider to adopt this kind of climate elements into the design and air ventilation assessment is the first one. The second one is start from the 2006 uh, so they, we consider the urban climate map and standards for wind environment feasibility. Because the previous one, the air ventilation assessment, more focusing on uh, the building site level, uh, but we need to get a comprehensive understanding about urban climate condition at the city level. So that is why uh, we consider to uh, we consider adopting such kind of urban climate map uh, to get a comprehensive understanding of urban climate condition at this entire city level for the planning purpose and urban design purpose. Um, and for our study subject objective, uh, there are three. The first one is to develop this kind of urban climate map, establishing the uh, wind performance criteria, refining the air ventilation assessment. And when we consider urban climate, we more focus on the wind and thermal situation, and also consider the local people's human thermal comfort. And um, I am not sure whether you already uh, heard the terms urban climate map before. Um, actually, the urban climate map, uh, there are two important con uh, components. The first one is urban climate analysis map, and the second one is urban climate uh, planning recommendation map. These two uh, components, uh, the first one is focusing on the scientific understanding, and second one is focusing on the planning recommendations and design. And overall, uh, if you check the literature review, you can find that uh, in entire city, entire world, we have rough uh, 15 countries, uh, more than 50 cities have conduct such kind of urban climate maps. Apart from uh, China, like the Japan and the German language uh, dominant countries, the, most of them, they already consider this kind of um, uh, urban climate map development. And I, I believe uh, in Brazil is the study conduct lead by the loose. Um, for the urban climate map, um, uh, through this kind of collaboration with loose, uh, we have uh, developed the Singapore, the Ho Chi Minh City, uh, even the RNM uh, in the Netherlands, and also Macau and uh, Kaohsiung City. And uh, uh, we also um, published one book edited by Ming and also Professor Edwin G. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to the Amazon, find the book. The book title is Urban Climate Map, a methodology for sustainable urban plannings. Uh, the book, including the methodology, the worldwide case studies, and also uh, the, the discussion and the consideration for the future trend for such kind of study.
Um, in Hong Kong, uh, when we conduct such kind of urban climate studies, uh, we actually we uh, actually we uh, have done a series of scientific studies, uh, including the modeling wing uh, simulations, uh, the side wing uh, measurement, uh, the user surveys, thermal compass surveys, uh, and and etc. So based on this uh, series scientific uh, studies and understanding, uh, we develop this urban climate map, uh, including the urban climate analysis map and the planning recommendation map. And for the urban climate map, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it in, uh, integrates urban climate factors and the town planning considerations. It provides a strategic information platform and urban climatic planning framework to planners for making informed planning uh, decisions. And the bottom one is show the Berlin and the Munich, um, Stuttgart, uh, their uh, urban climate map back to the 1980s or even earlier. So the most countries around the world already uh, uh, conduct or formula their urban climate maps. In Hong Kong, uh, this is a satellite image. You can see uh, most of the area is dominated by the country park and forest. Uh, actually, our built up areas only occupy 23 percentage. So that is why, um, because we have limited land resources for the housing. So in Hong Kong, uh, the most buildings are high rise and high densities. And uh, so we also consider this framework for urban climate map. At the beginning, uh, we collect urban parameters, uh, climatic data, and also conduct a series of technical scientific studies. Uh, and then uh, we can collect the information and understanding of the urban summer load, uh, wind dynamic potentials, and also the wind circulation information. And then we summarize uh, synergetic understanding into the urban climate tools to create a scientific understanding map, i.e. the urban climate analysis map, and then we translate the scientific understanding into the planning language, and uh, uh, we group the urban planning climate hopes into the urban climate planning zones uh, and identify the local air movement, air paths, and breezes. And then also we work together with the local government officials or planning department to create a series of planning recommendations and guidelines. Uh, just double check, can you hear me clearly? Uh, John has some mixed sounds in your, we can hear you, but there is another noise in between. Yeah, okay. maybe like, let me rejoin the Zoom again. Okay, uh, it's, it's now better? Yes, much better. Yeah, sorry. Um, because I work from home, so my home Wi-Fi may not be very stable. Um, sorry for cause any problem. Okay, so let's continue. And uh, in our uh, study, we consider the physical uh, equivalent temperature, i.e. the human thermal comfort index, uh, to synergize uh, wind information and also the thermal low situations to create a mapping system. And through this layer structure of urban climate analysis map, you can consider, you can see we already consider a series factor, including the building volume, uh, topography, uh, greenery, ground coverage, natural landscape, uh, the open space information, and also the further wind information. And based on the uh, wind information data and evaluation, we classify the entire city into the different uh, wind uh, situation or wind zone names, and also identify the key wind directions uh, and channeling wind situation, the sea breeze, the downhill air movement for the planning purpose. And in Hong Kong, uh, the entire urban climate map system, including the, uh, the several layers, and also for urban climate analysis map, there are eight urban climate classes. And when we are uh, considering the translation and also the planning purpose, uh, we combine eight urban climate 
gases into the five urban planning zonings and create uh, a series of planning recommendations. And for this, uh, we identify uh, the appropriate planning and design measures to improve the urban climate. And second line, uh, for pro provide such kind of strategic urban climate information platform for guiding the planning and development process for the future development. And also because of this urban climbing, uh, climatic planning framework, uh, we can uh, review the statutory uh, town plans and formulating the uh, suitable planning parameters. So overall, this kind of information can be a scientific tool to help us understand the urban climate situation and uh, provide a scientific evidence base, uh, this kind of analysis to support the, uh, the planning design and decision. In Hong Kong, uh, we put this kind of urban climate information uh, into, uh, at the outline zoning plan, uh, which is also the statutory plan. So the, the information from the map also provide the boundary condition and background understanding uh, for the building site level, uh, like this kind of further and detailed microclimate study and air ventilation study. And in Hong Kong, uh, we also developed the series design guidelines. If you're interested, you can go to the Hong Kong Planning Standard and Guidelines website and check the chapter 11. There's a guidelines on air ventilation. Uh, those uh, guidelines is a qualitative design recommendations. So we try to let people understand what is a good design in terms of the improving urban ventilation. And for the real application cases, you can see from the, uh, the screen, this is an old town renewal. The Guantong is one of the old town uh, in Hong Kong. And uh, we highlight uh, the, let's see. Uh, th so this is the area um, from the planning recommendation map. And this is a, a old town renewal plan. And for this, we're considering to uh, reduce the site coverage and in, uh, provide greening intensified at grade and set back from the narrow street and permeable podium, uh, inner site, air corridor and air pass uh, connectivity. So this is a kind of design principle we provide for the uh, architect when they consider this uh, urban renewal project. And so the uh, in the before uh, they start this project, this is a uh, old picture show the existing uh, town situation. But in future, you can see the projection. They considering the taller building, but more permeable, uh, more greening at the pedestrian level. So we try to provide a better living quality at the pedestrian level. And then, uh, because right now the urban climate map uh, mainly. Uh, be used at online zoning plan. So based on this information, uh, this maps, we can collect the information to uh, make a decision, for example, like the building height, building volume control, uh, the ground, the site coverage, uh, greenery, uh, open space, the building site back, uh, air pass connectivity, et cetera. And this is also another outline zoning plan uh, example. And so this is a, um, uh, area not far from the Truman area. And when they consider to redeal this area, uh, we provide, uh, we, we, have, we mark the area which is non-building area, i.e. we don't recommend any new uh, development project along this area. And also we dominate, uh, we highlight the dominant annual uh, and summer prevailing directions to let uh, the designer and planners understand the wind situation and also uh, highlight the braceway, the major braceway. So they, if they want to create new um, development project, they have to consider the to leave the gap, um, make the building set back um, to create this kind of braceway situations. And uh, this is another example uh, in Hong Kong, uh, this is Oak Kaitak Airport. Uh, so we're running the safety simulations and wind tunnel test uh, to understand the wind situation. And um, because originally this is airport, so the entire site is relatively flat and empty. Uh, when the local government official developed this master plan uh, layout, uh, based on the wing recommendations, uh, they can uh, make sure 
the straight grade following the incoming wind. And also uh, they have no this kind of great uh, gigantic building port and at ground level. So overall um, the entire site will be uh, better permeable and more greener. So this is a same project which I mentioned earlier. Um, so in future, the entire Guantong area will looks like this. Uh, although the building uh, height is increased, but pedestrian level, uh, we try to provide more open space and a greenery space uh, for the people. And uh, apart from the Hong Kong Urban Climate Map Project, right now a series of uh, government documents already mention this uh, urban climate application exercise and highlight the importance in the future uh, planning practice. For example, right now in the in Hong Kong, our uh, long-term strategy planning vision, transcending uh, 2030, uh, they also mentioned this urban climate map uh, consideration in the new town plan and old town renewal. And also if you refer to the Hong Kong Climate Change Report, uh, the Environmental Bureau also highlight importance, the urban climate application and the consideration uh, to deal with such kind of changing climate. And in 2018, we worked together with Hong Kong Green Building Councilor to create a guidebook on urban microclimate study and try to educate the practitioner and the general public, the urban climate knowledge, uh, and also uh, demonstrate what is the best uh, good local design practice in Hong Kong in terms of uh, urban climate applications. Uh, if you're interested, you can Google this. Uh, they are all available online. And apart from Hong Kong, we have uh, got um, many invitations in uh, Milan, China, uh, Singapore, uh, Taiwan for this kind of urban climate map project. Um, so this is another example from the Kaohsiung city, Taiwan. And back to the, I think 2011 or 2012, and so the Kaohsiung is an industry city in the Taiwan, and they are uh, considering this um, eco-planning uh, uh, target. And also uh, we consider how to uh, create international collaboration of the topic issue uh, on the climate change. And based on this urban climate mass study, uh, they can get a strategic sustainable development recommendations uh, so they, that is why uh, we conduct the study for them. And uh, Kaohsiung city, um, you know, is a coastal city with a high population density suited in the subtropical climate region uh, with hot and humid summers. And uh, so they uh, experience a serious uh, environmental challenge and problems, including the air temperature rise, uh, air pollution issues, the high urban density exists, um, population continues to increase, especially the elderly people are in the aging society. Um, and uh, also they uh, have the similar, this kind of urban heat island intensity problems. Um, so for this study, uh, we focus on the four aspects. Uh, the, the wind uh, aspect means uh, we consider urban climate information, especially wind and urban climate information. And second one is water system. Because Kaohsiung is a coastal city and they have a full of the rivers, pond, lakes, and sea. Um, so that is why we consider how to adopt the water bodies into the planning purpose. And the, the next one is a greenery, uh, how to use existing greenery, forest, and open space to improve the uh, comfortable situation. And the last one is um, we put all this kind of consideration into the urban uh, context and their planning structure and to uh, provide this kind of tailor-made uh, planning recommendations. And entire uh, methodology, including the uh, four steps, um, the the first one is about data collection and evaluation. The second one is focused on the thermal stress, uh, dynamic potential wind formation. And then we develop basic input layers and evaluation analysis. Last one is we create urban climate map and planning recommendations. 
So you can see uh, we map all the different uh, layers, uh, the topographic condition, population density, uh, the land use, urban heat island uh, distribution map, the natural landscape uh, map, water system, uh, prevailing wind directions, the land and sea breeze uh, phenomenon also has been documented into the two maps. Um, then um, we synergize the different understanding to create urban climate map for Kaohsiung. And based on this, we can highlight um, the area which is uh, mitigation action needed, uh, some action required and preserved or enhanced um, based on this scientific understanding of urban climate analysis. And then uh, the different district, uh, we provide a menu of effective control measures and the different district, they have the specific uh, recommendations for improvement. Um, so for the rec design recommendations, the first one we focus on the wing aspect. So we respect the cooling effect from the, uh, the mountains and also uh, identify the air paths from the hillside uh, to the downtown areas. And also uh, we respect the cooling effect from the rivers, uh, respect the sea, uh, sea breeze penetrations, and also uh, considering the dominant wind direction. So we highlight uh, the north and uh, south oriented main uh, roads as important major air pathways, and also highlight the, the west to east oriented main roads as a minor air paths, in the, especially in the summer. And for the water um, aspect recommendation, we consider the cooling branches um, at the waterfront, uh, the cooling branches at the seafront, and also the how to create uh, the cooling network uh, to penetrate this kind of cooling effect into the surrounding areas, and also uh, expansion cooling effect from the waterfront areas. And for the greenery, uh, we identify the area which is suitable for uh, green belt systems, the greenery fingers and a green circle around industry areas, uh, the green rail uh, track, uh, green circle in the central urban areas and a green line along the major roads. And in the end, uh, for the downtown areas, uh, we provide the detailed planning recommendations uh, and also uh, provide the projection for the future. If they adopt this, uh, you can see this kind of cooling branches link the, uh, from the hillside to the uh, residential area. And also uh, using the water river as a major pathway uh, to make sure the cooling effect can penetrate to the surrounding urban areas. Um, so overall, I think for this kind of urban climate study, uh, we try to provide a high quality living for now and for the future. And uh, I, I guess Cambodian government and also local researchers have a similar vision. So let's do more better future for our generation, next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ren, for that uh, detailed methodological and analytical presentation from multiple cities. Uh, I think it does uh, emphasize just how many uh, disciplines, meteorology, planning, building materials must be engaged for developing such, uh, such complex uh, plans and recommendations. Uh, I believe we have approximately um, uh, 20 more minutes left, a little bit over 20 minutes left for our presentation. So um, I, I, I would invite uh, uh, Dr. Naida Chin uh, perhaps would be, or uh, I'm not sure if you decided which, which of the two of you want to go to, to do the next presentation. And then of course, after the presentations, we'll have um, hopefully enough time uh, for questions from all of the people participating in this uh, wonderful uh, webinar. Well, good morning. Uh, uh, very early, very early morning, uh, German cities. Yeah, this presentation, uh, me and Ben Leng uh, will be uh, uh, doing just on one slide, and I, I will just give uh, you some kind of the uh, uh, orientations uh, or, or introduction to the to the, the this study. And as you may know, we are one of the we are one of the uh, member in the working working package number five, 
which is related to the urban climate, right? So it seems that we are focusing on the on the only the micro scale, but actually when we we talk about the urban climate in Phnom Penh, we we should talk uh, more about the uh, what kind of the urban developments and then and then the uh, uh, urban features that contribute to the the urban uh, microclimates and also uh, the uh, climate in Cambodia as in the world. So let me start from the, uh, from the, can you move to the next step, the uh, link? Next slide, please. So in here, you can see the, 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 the city, city maps uh, and uh, you can see the, uh, it's just kind of uh, orientations. The, when you see this map, you can see the uh, some kind of the major rivers and water bodies located. So, really, it seems that we we first disconnect. Okay. Get it. So here, uh, if we if we look at the kind of the regional climates, you have the winds the blowing in, in Cambodian, uh, especially in the cities, from the northeast, you know, northeast and then uh, 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 southwest. When you have the, the southwest wind blowing, you have a kind of, you know, the, the wet seasons, you know, this kind of the, uh, you have a lot of moisture, you have kind of a cool conditions blowing or coming to the cities. And then when you have this kind of dry seasons, you know, the, the wind is blowing from the northeast, meaning that coming from, I put in the contact, like the, the, wind, is, the wind is coming from Kampung Cham or, or it's lost the slide. Sorry, just lost the slide. So the during the dry season, you would expect the wind is blowing from Kampung Cham or from north northeast of the of the cities. Uh, if you if you look in the uh, broader pictures, you will see that uh, the cities always have some kind of the uh, uh, moistures feeding into the cities if the wind is carrying the moistures. Uh, for sure that the when the wind during the wet seasons you will always have the moistures but what about the, during dry seasons uh, you would expect also the moisture feeding into the cities because we have the we have the 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 great lakes you know the the Tonlesa rivers and the mekong river where you have major bodies uh, of waters uh, sitting just you know the eastern part of the cities and in this case, let's say, let's let put into a context when you have these kind of the uh, uh, urban development very intense along the rivers, especially on the west side of the west side of the west side of the rivers of the Tunlesa rivers or along the junctions. And in this case, you would expect the eastern part, you know, the, the, the eastern part of the city would, would be under the, the, the shadows of the buildings and in this case you would expect a lot of you know the uh, a change in in uh, urban climates mainly uh, people uh, in the west part of the cities and you know from Wat Phnom toward the toward the 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 the, the, the Pojendong airport you would you would expect a lot of dry you know you you, you don't really get the moisture um, Carrying from the, the the wind the wind blowing from the eastern the northeast uh, north northeast to the to the southwest. In this case, uh, uh, if you are talking about the uh, urban climate, we may just focus on this kind of the you know the wind blowings is part part of the part of the the, the, the study. And and then Bunlein will give you more detail how we are going to mo monitors all this kind of the all these kind of the winds, uh, directions, uh, our temperatures and the moisture within the, the, the Phnom Penh, we will we'll, we'll talk more. But what I, what I really want to, to emphasize, uh, emphasize that the urban architecture would be able to, to, to uh, what say, to 
mitigates, you know, the mitigates this kind of the urban air ventilation to make sure that all the people either in the west or the south, in the west or the east, they will benefit from this kind of the, the what say the urban ventilations. I think, uh, I, I just give you this kind of the introduction you may add more. So please go ahead, Lin. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Nida, uh, so much. Uh, uh, okay, so first, uh, first of all, I would like to introduce it a little bit uh, for our case study uh, in Phnom Penh and uh, uh, for the urban climate condition, we also use observation material, as you see, is an uh, automatic weather station. We installed some uh, in Phnom Penh already. Uh, now we have a file already, but I just based on it too, depends on the data. Uh, we are already analyzes. So uh, one in uh, considered as a, a central business districts in Banking Kong, another one is uh, both Sanjay in uh, uh, all UP campus too. So uh, this is our material we also collected and just uh, preliminary data of finding of our vent ventilation and also abundant island analysis. So uh, this is uh, our material that we, we, we observe for the data ob observation. And with some calculation, uh, we use some calculation like abundant island intensity and also abundant island rate and uh, diagonal and seasonal uh, abundant island during daytime and nighttime at all. So this is uh, some, some um, a methodology and our equations that we, we use to calculate uh, of, uh, our, our uh, observation data. And this is, uh, will I, I would like to show this, uh, the, the urban land use, urban land use or land cover of Phnom Penh between 2003 and 2017. So uh, Phnom Penh as, is considered as a rapid, a rapid urbanizing rapid urbanize, uh, urbanization either. So land use will change very fast. You can see the observation. You can see uh, the observation here, uh, in 2013, you can see uh, urban, central dis, uh, uh, urban central district is uh, very small, but compared to, compared to the 2017, it's uh, uh, I mean, urban sprawl very fast. So depends on this and then, some area, most of the area of Phnom Penh also become the empirical surface and uh, dominant and dominated buildings. And uh, high rise, high rise buildings either and narrow streets comes out and reduce the ventilation and also it is urban heat island intensities. Through observation, we could see the tem temperature differences uh, uh, between urban and suburban areas. As, uh, Banking Kong considered as a central business districts. The temperatures are higher than uh, Bo San Jay or suburban area. You could see here it's 15.1 and 13.1 degrees Celsius. And the mean is also different, at least 0 0.7 degrees Celsius. And for the, the, the increase intensity and rate of abundant depends on a calculation between uh, central business area and suburban areas, we could see the intensity is 1.3 degrees Celsius and rate is 0.15 percent for the uh, uh, temperature differences of both area. And the maximum, you can see the maximum and minimum uh, the the time temperature different. Banking Kong is higher than. Um, uh, post and J, or I could say uh, central business district and sub, uh, sub urban area. You could see the here is uh, 15 compared to 12.9 degrees Celsius. And very low temperatures is in uh, sub urban area because of uh, some, some uh, parameters, some factors, especially for ventilation to reduce uh, the heat uh, increase in the uh, urban area. <clears throat> And maximum, 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 minimum uh, day time temperature different between Banking Kong and Po San Chi is also different a little bit more because uh, Banking Kong is at the night time is uh, cooler than and cooler than uh, Po San Chi. You could see the observation depends on the data observation here. And uh, variability of the Banhit Island. 
the denial variability of the Banking Island on the average. Banking Kong is higher than uh, at least uh, could see 5.1 degrees Celsius and percentage is 3.7 degrees Celsius. But refer to the daily and night uh, abundant intensity in the dry season, especially in during uh, uh, November to April, on average, you could see the temperatures is also a bit different. You could see 10.3 uh, degree in Banking Kong and 8.7 degrees Celsius in uh, both century. And uh, the maximum no, minimum is not quite different, just yes, it's 5.6 and 5.7 degrees Celsius. And the daytime uh, during the wet season, May to October, on average, Banking Kong is still high, at least one degree, at least one degree Celsius different between uh, Banking Kong and Po and Jay. But for the maximum, it's not quite different. And for the seasonal, Seasonal uh, variability of uh, urban heat island intensity during the daytime is Banking Kong is one degree and percentage is 0 0.8 degrees Celsius. And seasonal during the nighttime is not much different, but higher in, in the uh, uh, suburban area than central business districts. Concerned with uh, uh, ventilation, ventilation, as you may know, as uh, Dr. Chowren already introduced, is also play a very important role to reduce the intensity and rate of uh, the Banhit Island in a city scale. Uh, depend on uh, the data observation indicate that uh, urbanizing areas are very low wind blow compared to the urban uh, compared to the suburban area. Why? Because of the high buildings block some wind cannot flow in the area that we observe, especially in Banking Kong, that considered as a urbanizing area. So westerly wind can mitigate the intensity of the urban islands and the high dense, high and dense building in the central business may reduce in wind flow winds. And that's why it increase the urban island in the burn area. So the ventilation uh, through the observation during dry season, you see the, uh, the, the wind direction is also uh, come from uh, the north and northwest direction. But, you know, it's uh, some change in south to southwest direction during February and March. And the wet season is north and north and north south direction either. But it changed to south and southwest during only August, during a rain, uh, rain season or dry, uh, sorry, uh, rainy season. And the wind flow at the sub area is mostly we we'll see the different north and north, north and northeast direction, but turn to south and south and southwest direction during March and April. But the wet is also south and southwest. So we could see a difference between dry seasons. Not much change depends on the regional wind uh, wind flow. So in conclusion, our key findings we we'll see temperature different between. Uh, uh, central business districts and, su and suburban areas is more or less uh, one, uh, one degree Celsius. So you could see in uh, Banking Kong is 10.1 10 10 uh, degree Celsius and, and, and 8.9 degree Celsius. So the increase intensity is more or less 1.3 degree Celsius and 0.15% of the rate of urban development. And the maximum and minimum daytime it could see 15 for the central business and 12.9 is for the suburban areas. And the nighttime is not much different between central business and suburban areas. For the uh, digital variability of the Bunhit Island, on average, you could see uh, much different here 5.1 and 3.7 is almost. Uh, two degrees Celsius between the difference of the both area. And the day and night in, in the dry season is could be uh, not much different for the maximum, but the minimum, uh, min, uh, maximum is also different. Yeah. And the daytime and night for the bad season is quite less, quite similar. It's just only 1.3 1, 1 degrees Celsius difference. So for the uh, uh, Seasonal variability of Banhit Island then during daytime is 
1.0 in Central Business District and 0 0.8 in uh, in suburban areas. This is could see not much different, but you know, in for the nighttime is uh, different from the daytime because of the high temperatures can uh, uh, central business district depends on the data calculation or observation. So the wind flow is almost same direction in the central bis central uh, uh, business district during the dry and wet season, but you know, in suburban area is also different, north and west and south and uh, south, north and east and south and west direction depends on the, uh, the season, I mean the wet or dry seasons. So the different, we can say uh, the uh, wind speed or wind uh, velocity between both areas, central business and suburban areas, Banking Kong is, is very low compared to uh, sub urban areas post and is very high in speed in, and different between that is also 1.8 uh, meter per second in average. So uh, thank you for my presentation. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chin and uh, uh, Bunling Se for that presentation uh, applied to applied to Phnom Penh. Um, we are now, and thank you very much for the presentation coming right on time. So we're on a good schedule now, and we will have at least uh, 30 minutes uh, for, for questions. Um, I will, as the moderator, I will uh, take uh, one privilege here, and that is to pose one question first, and then we, um, and then we have uh, uh, then 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 we will have questions from uh, from the other participants. Uh, the question that I want to uh, frame is for uh, for Dr. Dr. Ren, who gave us the very uh, uh, wonderful uh, and dense presentation of the analytics of developing uh, urban climate maps and the implications for policy. I'm just wondering, uh, of course, over the history of urban planning, there have been many master plans in multiple cities and regions, uh, and many of those plans uh, have not been fully executed or even partially executed in part because of social, economic, political reasons. And I guess my question to you is that this urban analytical work, which is very complex, uh, but also very convincing as to the needs for how to live uh, in a sustainable, a livable city. To what extent have any cities that you've worked in or any to your knowledge actually implemented plans based on these kinds of, uh, uh, of uh, planning documents that take into account urban heat island effects uh, and uh, issues of uh, climate change? Or is it too, shall we say, too early in the analytical work uh, that this has not been uh, absolutely adopted in any particular particular urban uh, or conurbation? Um, thanks, Alan, for your question. Um, I think apart from Hong Kong and Taiwan, uh, nowadays the mainland city in China uh, have already uh, started this kind of urban climate implementation in the real design practice. Uh, since 2019, the, the central government of China, the Ministry of Natural Resources, already uh, announce a uh, compulsory regulation, uh, the legal document and ask uh, all the cities uh, to create urban ventilation corridor plan along with some um, city master plan. So that means uh, they have to do this kind of air ventilation assessment, uh, urban climate uh, evaluation in their master plan, uh, updating or uh, revision, this kind of real design practical uh, situation. And uh, for the European cities, uh, Lou definitely can show you more real cases from Germany. Um, and apart from Germany, uh, I guess most of us uh, know that in 2003 and 2006, uh, there are two important uh, extreme heat events, the heat waves, which has caused a lot of people dead um, because of that uh, set uh, events. So since then, uh, the, I think the most uh, European cities already start consider the climate information or even the climate change 
uh, information into their city planning and uh, uh, design. So for example, in my previous uh, presentation, uh, we have worked together with Arnhem City in the Netherlands uh, to create urban climate map. And apart from that, uh, Toulouse in France also already considered this urban climate map. So Toulouse definitely can tell you more uh, worldwide experience, um, not only just use urban climate map, but also the urban climate consideration into the real design uh, urban planning projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. I really appreciate that. Uh, Lutz, did you want to? Yeah, I, I, I think it's exactly correct that uh, the issue gets more and more important in, in many parts of the world. But for example, in, in Germany, we have a law, a federal building code, where, where it says that we have to respect climate. Th that means any development taking place has to consider climate and urban climate. Of course, it's not directly said how you do it. And therefore, we produce guidelines in order. And one guideline is the urban climate map. In other countries, like in the Netherlands, they uh, respect this without a uh, definite law. So they just say, this is important because of flooding, because of the heat island, and, and uh, urban development has to take this into, into account, uh, which areas should be built and which not. Yeah, I would just say just quickly, I know that here uh, in actually the city of Chicago, there's quite a bit of this sort of work going on. And one of the interesting things that wasn't really touched upon in this presentation, but is certainly uh, key, at least in this particular uh, conurbation, uh, is that the urban heat island effect has been uh, shown to be correlated at least partially with uh, urban e inequalities. That is, people who live in certain areas of the city, very dense, uh, underserved city, parts of the city with no parks, with no access to water, of course, they're experiencing much more stress and they're stress along multiple environmental vectors, including uh, urban contamination and so forth. So I'm sure uh, the urban uh, heat island effect does intersect with many other environmental problems and they probably do intersect when you map this out potentially with social mapping as well that might show uh, real inequalities emerging. And then of course that has become here at least uh, a, a clarion call, if not an actual implementation yet for doing this kind of work and, and making these kinds of uh, uh, implementations and interventions to make the city more livable for all its inhabitants, not just simply the wealthy who have access to uh, green and, and can escape the city from, from time to time. Uh, thank, thanks for answering those questions. We actually have uh, uh, several several more, so let me just uh, uh, frame them. Uh, the first question, uh, this is uh, really for anyone, uh, but basically uh, the question posed was, is it possible to connect urban climate analysis with spatial socioeconomic patterns? If yes, what are your conclusions? So I think this might be directed to both you, Lutz, and to, uh, and, and to uh, Dr. Wren. To all, all the panelists. Louis, do you want to get, go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can do the first. Yes, of course. So the maps, it, of course, all the maps uh, are relying on the input data. And the, the size of the data uh, can be different. But for example, for Plum Pen, we really aim uh, for at least 30 meters grids. That means we can uh, define local sites. And uh, the, what the question remains for the, the pattern is really that we, we can give recommendations for thermal comfort, which means a comfort of living, what also Nida has told. What we want to have a uh, comfort of living in the streets, in the open spaces, and this we can provide in a very detailed uh, map. And from the detailed map comes the detailed recommendations. And if you have done this, this comes together with the different disciplines. Right. Another question um, actually related to, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm, pardon me. Uh, uh, yeah, um, I, it's, it's a very interesting question. I think uh, earlier Alan already pointed out a similar um, question, like the social equity uh, inequity situation. <clears throat> Uh, definitely, uh, we consider this. So, for example, like the IPCC, uh, the latest uh, report talk about 
uh, adaptation. So they recommend a triangle analysis, which is considering the in uh, the hazard uh, exposure vulnerability, especially for the vulnerability part. Um, uh, IPCC uh, suggests people consider this kind of social economic, economic situations. So after uh, synergizing the three aspects, the evaluation and considerations, the, this kind of risk could be detected and people can understand behind the risk, which is the dominant factors cause this kind of situation. Um, so for example, uh, recently we conducted a heat risk map for Hong Kong and by adopting this kind of triangle analysis, so we can tell people even some area, they probably experience a higher temperature, the hot situation, but if there is no elderly people or no um, this kind of poor people live there, probably they, they don't suffer. Uh, and so if they, even they have the similar risk level, but uh, the reasons or factors behind it could be different. And with this kind of analysis, we can uh, provide scientific evidence support for the policy decision and uh, consideration. So that is definitely we have to consider this kind of social economic information uh, and even the social demographic information into the climate analysis, uh, especially if we want to support the policy decisions. Thank you. Uh, there's actually a somewhat related question, a, a, a couple still pending, and I invite everyone participating to post more questions as we as we move forward in this discussion, which is quite quite rich and revelatory. Though the one question is actually one that uh, uh, replicates one that I had in my mind as well, uh, and so I'll just read this. Uh, it's a comment and a question, uh, and basically the comment is that master plans often are too realistic at large scale implementation. The latest trend is to be more adaptive by using strategic development plans or integrated development <clears throat> plans. The question is, what would be the realistic approach for the locality to plan their area according to the urban climate? And this was somewhat of a question that I had in terms of how do you scale this up to the size of the enormous conurbations and hyper cities, particularly of Asia and Africa for that matter, uh, that are absolutely uh, talking about hundreds of square miles. How do, you, how do you put a master plan together and how do you actually see being implemented over what, uh, about over what time frame? So I think this is a, this is a really important question when you're thinking about the beauty of the science is, is clear. The clarity of the science is wonderful, but the question is how do you then make that uh, intervention work? So I think that's part of, uh, part of the question. So any, anyone can take, take the question. But, I'm not direct, <laughs> anyway, this is just a general question that I think is quite- no, the, This is quite important because we are discussing, discussing a lot about this in Germany also. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How can we bring this into practice? And of course, it would be nicest if you are in the beginning already, if you develop projects, if climate is one issue also already in the planning, so that we can recommend the design. And But often it's like that, that they already decided upon neighborhoods, and then they start building and ask us how can they, they buffer some problems. So this is not the, the correct answer of a new, a new development should right from the beginning designed with a clim climatical oriented design. But in the master plan, it's already fixed sometimes. So we would like to have influence in the master plan already. But this of course means again, it's more complex that we, the master plan makes a decision of one area, but we have to understand the mesoclimate of the, herb, the total urban city as well. So we have to understand how the principle of ventilation, and then we can have the, this input into the master plan of the local situation. So it's all a bit connected. And therefore, especially here in Phnom Penh, also what Nita said, we try to understand the regional circulation, the regional climate, and this is included already <clears throat> in the urban climate map. And the urban climate map can then develop further things. And also in, in one of the chat questions, they, uh, they state about the, the small difference of air temperatures in, in Phnom Penh, of, of the, the rural area or the sub area thing. So thermal comfort is not air temperature alone. 
Air temperature is for us an indicator to calibrate our urban climate map. But thermal comfort is dominated by ventilation and radiation. That means what we normally calculate is the mean radiation temperature. And this is our thermal comfort. That means 20 or 30 degrees in shadow, 30 degrees with wind is different. And this, therefore, the, the small difference in air temperature doesn't say uh, all, all the, the, the thermal comfort. It's only one, one part of it, but it's definitely needed for calibration and for understanding. By the way, we have last time when we were there, we had an investigation area and where we did some measurements and we could see there with our uh, data that open spaces have an, a very important cooling effect during night, not during day, but during night. And these small effects <clears throat> then also come uh, into practice if you do design, okay? We need the houses, but the part of it also we need nocturnal cooling. So in order to, to buffer these, these things. But this has to again, sorry, but this has again to be located within the urban climate map. Right, thank you. I think, I, uh, this I'm is going for the... go, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, okay. we, we will learn from Dr. Chauran about this kind of from research to 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 uh, <clears throat> Uh, implementations, but in in our project, I think uh, we should highlight our build for people projects. It's a bit uh, we have very specific designs. You know, we try to involve uh, the the policy makers, the mainly the 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 city halls, to be part of our projects. So along the way, you know, from from the design to the implementation phase, we always have, we always have them on board. Uh, and and also we are trying to uh, uh, invite more uh, participatory approach. We are trying to understand the local priorities. We are trying to understand the local needs, and then we are trying to uh, respond to those needs based on our research finding. And we hope that uh, you know from this kind of the engagement, uh, especially from the senior minister, uh, senior the officer from the uh, the city house. Uh, uh, we, 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 we think that uh, our research is not, not just for the for Professor Lutz, but also for the, for the, the city halls uh, as, a, as their ownerships. So that, that, that is what we, we think, the, 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 the trying to uh, you know, uh, exercise our finding into the, the planning uh, and, and, and actions. Yes, let's let hear from, from Professor James. Uh, Rents. Uh, what is the well, how 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 she can influence on the 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 policymaker or planners from Hong Kong perspective? Uh, in Hong Kong, um, because we have SARS in two thousand three, uh, so the both government and also the local people quite worried about environmental hygiene by that time. And then uh, the government uh, conduct a massive uh, government report, which is called Team Clean Report, to review the different aspect and try to detect what is the potential reasons to cause such kind of disease uh, very quickly spread the entire city. And since then, uh, we consider a serious climate uh, related studies into the design and also the policy uh, decisions. And, um, and also later, I think, uh, apart from Hong Kong, different cities or countries, uh, they may have their political agenda. And uh, when we uh, work together with the local government, on one hand side, we have to understand what their political agenda, political need. And the second hand is we need to see how to use the scientific evidence support uh, to this kind of political decision. And so that is why uh, in mainland China nowadays, uh, the wind corridor plan is uh, the popular one. Um, in Hong Kong, nowadays we talk about uh, climate change adaptation, the city resilience. And uh, uh, in Singapore, they never talk about heat wave, they just talk about warm season. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> so, I mean, as a researcher, a scientist, um, we have to 
uh, to understand this kind of situation and try to provide uh, the scientific data and uh, support, uh, then we can make this kind of study into the real change or real influence on the society or community. Uh, I like the fact that we're, you're answering questions in the chat and in the Q&A box, uh, as well as uh, uh, here verbally. Um, I, I would take this point uh, to uh, Dr. Chin mentioned the par participatory approach of uh, Build for People. Now, as an anthropologist, I do work in both quantitative and qualitative work. Uh, of course, what you've presented here is almost uh, basic, well, it's almost fundamentally urban science. It's based on sensors, it's based on meteorology, it's based on river flow, hydrology, all of this is essential. And I'm wondering on the participatory side, is your methodology incorporating uh, interviews, uh, large scale interviews, household interviews, uh, not simply with policymakers, but with residents? Do you do focus groups? So I'm just wondering how you are integrating. For, for us in the research that I do in, in Cambodia, it's always a question, uh, how do we integrate the qualitative and the quantitative to come up with things that make sense for, after all, these are sustainable designs for people. And, and of course, you're, that's why you have build for people. But I'm just wondering if you incorporate, as an anthropologist, I'd like to assume you incorporate anthropologists and sociologists in the work. But I, I'm just curious if you could comment briefly on that. I, I don't want to dominate the questions for their, it's for our uh, uh, participants, but I'm really curious about, about this dimension. Um, yeah, definitely. Actually, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention this. Um, in Hong Kong, for such kind of government consult uh, studies, uh, we, uh, we definitely involve the, the stakeholder engagement. Um, so uh, we have this kind of workshop at the beginning, midterm, and also the end. Uh, try to collect the different opinions, suggestions from the relevant stakeholders and also practitioners. So that is why uh, we work together with uh, local um, practitioner institutions like the Hong Kong Institute of Architects, uh, the Hong Kong Green Building Councilor, Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong Institute of Planners. And also uh, we work together with the local communities, uh, especially for those kind of outline zoning plan. Uh, there is a town planning board exercise. So they once they uh, publish or release this kind of new town planning strategy, they will have a public consultation. Um, so at least in Hong Kong, we have this um, general public engagement in every governmental consultant, uh, this kind of project. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I guess, for, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Um, for our own scientific research or studies, uh, it really depends. And sometimes we work together with uh, people from social works or uh, social science, and then uh, we'll involve this part. Uh, for example, one of the recent projects is focusing on the heat wave. So we want to understand what is the uh, the people's need and also uh, the behavior and also what's their uh, response during this kind of heat wave situation. Uh, and also try to understand the poor people or elderly people, how they uh, can survive during this kind of heat wave. Uh, so that is why we involve definitely the, the people from social science, yeah. I, I would just, uh, just from my perspective as well, uh, it would be really wonderful to have a conversation subsequently at some point about a particular uh, approach that we're taking with a, a new a new software tool uh, called SenseMaker, which basically uh, collects uh, literally thousands of what you could call micro narratives from people uh, were posing questions about migration in our case and, uh, and environmental change. And, uh, and these micro narratives can then be scaled up. Uh, it's not as if it's uh, you know, deep ethnography as anthropologists do uh, living in, in communities for a year. Uh, but in other words, there is an interesting way to try to try to navigate between the quantitative urban science and the and the urban uh, sociology, I might or the social dimension. So that, that that's for a conversation for for another time. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to see if there are any um, other questions coming from uh, coming from our participants here. I'm looking to see. I think I don't see any pending think... questions, but uh, yes. I Please just want to add the, the you know, the, one again, uh, our projects designed from, from work package one to work package seven. And each right. work package, they, they focus uh, 
different aspects and and we we normally we have this kind of the crossing the platforms meaning that the the, the project leader like professor lute will talk to other project leaders and then they the the kind of exchange information data so that we can triangulate the finding you know from social aspect to physical aspects so uh, i hope that this this research uh, can you know kind of well rounded research we can integrate all the, all aspects not just the architecture by itself but also the social perspective psychological perspective we put everything in together the thing is like uh, we we I think uh, we we try to 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 uh, kind of the put all harmonize the research finding together so that the policy makers can understand not just only from pers- um, social perspective but also the 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 physical perspective and and, and the urban design as well. I think Professor Lit know more about that. Uh, I think he he may have a better answer than me. <laughs> yeah, but but also. Uh, Michael Weibel just wrote in the chat that within the Build of People project, uh, there is, we, we try to communicate or to, to find means how we can communicate the findings, what you just said, the findings, the results uh, to the, uh, the policy or to the decision, to the decision. This is the, the way, because we, or especially me as a scientist, I can make recommendations, but I'm not in the field of the politics. So I don't know uh, what, what they need, though there must, this is an interaction. So I can, can offer research, I can, can offer findings, but I cannot decide. So the, to communicate this is very important thing. And uh, I know, especially also in, in Hong Kong, Chao, the first thing we made the map, but nobody was interested to publish a map. So that, then it went through, through newspapers simply that Edward by the time was very uh, active and said, okay, we have to publish somehow, not only in science magazines, nobody from the administration reads the journals, but we have to go in the public. And so this was done. I think this also gave a quite big push in, in, in the whole discussion. And the same in, in Stuttgart, when they start 1918, nobody takes care about Urban Heat Island or something like that. So, but what they did is uh, they published things by, by that time, no? by, by copies and other well. This is also what we, we have to do. But sometimes the, the language or the gap between science world and the administration world is difficult. So both sides have to, to, to find wordings, to find uh, uh, yeah, figures or other things uh, to communicate even better. And maybe the, the visual thing is quite a good, good way to, to do it because some of the graphs, nobody understands what we produce. And, and so and they don't know how they, they use it in, in their maps. So this is a, a task which Especially, I think, in the Build of People project now, we try to, to understand and to, to do things about it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I must say, as Dr. Chin mentioned, the uh, various packages you have, uh, that is different analytical foci, that you uh, develop sustainable neighborhoods, building materials, urban climate, uh, all the rest of that. Uh, it's totally comprehensive. It's an extraordinary model. But I'm wondering if, uh, I don't see another question, so I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to pose one final question on my part. And that is, I'm wondering in these seven, six or seven, uh, as you call them, packages, where you're doing analytical work from different frames of reference and on different subjects, do you have a coordinating uh, 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 analytic that's going to bring all of these seven or six packages together in some kind of a comprehensive uh, report? Uh, or uh, is, that, is that something that's already out there and available to, uh, to, to look at? That would, be, uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful to see how you model this and how you're going to integrate this information across multiple, uh, multiple disciplines. Yeah, we, we, we try this. So, for example, in the workshop, we had a, a neighborhood already mm-hmm. and choose a neighborhood which is right. partly built, which is partly non-built. So, uh, in this case, uh, 
for example, if we discuss about thermal comfort uh, and why people going out or, or why they only use the places in shadow, you have to understand uh, how the, the quantity to, to quantify the thermal comfort. And then we can say, okay, in this area, uh, we need that tree or we need a green facade or we have, we, we need a completely different uh, orientation of buildings. But uh, this has, because uh, as, as a climatologist, I don't know uh, much about the politics and the decision paths and, and, and about the social science. So as also Chao said, this is always one was in the thermal comfort, we work together with, with uh, social people because they know the, how to do interviews. They know how to, to bring physics together with, with, uh, with the thermal comfort, uh, the suspected uh, thermal comfort. This is very uh, important. It's not only in the quantity and this we, we try uh, to bring together. But we, sometimes we have to do it on the local spot because then it's easier to talk with people. But again, for us, it's also the Mesa scale we also have to consider. And this makes it for, for us more complicated sometimes. Right, yeah, I, can, I can appreciate that. Uh, we do have one question. I, I believe we have uh, just about three or four minutes left. Uh, and there is one question, I, I guess you would call it an empirical question and a very interesting one that is framed and uh, in the chat, I see it's, uh, and this could be for, for I, I think for Bun Lang perhaps, uh, or, or, for, or for Dr. Chin, uh, and that is what area of Phnom Penh is the most vulnerable to climate change and why? Yeah. This was, when I was there, I was a bit uh, traveling around. And uh, for example, here in Kassel, in my city where I live in Germany, we made a, a, a scenario where we saw that the heat island is shifting. It is shifting in areas where is now industry and they change it to, to residential. So in, in Phnom Penh, you have the city, it's very dense, there you need ventilation, but it's not so much different. But if you go to the outside, where they now start the big developments, and there you will have the most problems in future. I'm quite sure about that. Is that a consensus? <laughs> I think uh, I, I would just add up to Professor Lert and But by the way, you know, the, in, in, in our bill for people, we have a uh, work page uh, servant, where the, you have Professor Michael who, who coordinate all of the work package leaders and putting together. And also in terms of, term of the communication, the finding, we, we have, the, we call it a eco transitional, transitional labs in, mm -hmm. in, in a local uh, governance, uh, government so that they, you know, they, they are taking care of those kind of the labs so that they, they, they got the information from our research findings. So now answering you the and answering you the research uh, the, the where the area in Phnom Penh is, is vulnerable to the climate change. Uh, when before we answer these this questions, uh, somebody already answered, but actually we have to put into a context what kind of hazards that 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 that, that related to this climate change. For example, for example, like say uh, floods. Of course, those uh, the those area uh, uh, next to the uh, the mm -hmm. rivers, for example, like this uh, Stung, Stung Prak Nod, let, let's say Kandang Kao is very prone to, fly, to, to floods. But and then in, in terms of the heat, you know, then you have see Bang Ging Kong, the, where the central of business would face a lot of these kind of uh, heat islands. They will consume more, a lot of electricity. They have to turn on the aircon all the time, you know. So, so it's, it, it just depends uh, where you are talking about. Uh, and if, the, if you are talking about the heat bales, uh, heat prawns areas, and then you would talk about some area, different areas. Uh, for example, let's say the, if you are talking about in general, let's say uh, urban air pollution, and then you would say in general, if you, if you don't uh, uh, prepare well in terms of the building orientations, air ventilations, then Phnom Penh sometimes can be choked like in Bangkok. You know, in, you have a lot of uh, particles in the cities and then you get kind of the air pollutions. So that in general, yeah. 
and 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 then when you're talking about what say a a a, a draft or, or or water supply, and then you would talk about the uh, uh somebody outskirts of the cities where you have la- you you you're not you don't really have access to these uh water supply systems, and then when uh, when when you have a, a water supply is kind of challenge, and then those area would 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 have no water to to use for their cooking or. or having a bus. So I would say, uh, where is it, uh, where is the most prompt in, in terms of the climate change? And then we say it depends on the hazard by itself. Okay. okay thank uh, that's you. It. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that question. Well, we've reached our time precisely 1230. Uh, and I, I did just want to thank on behalf of uh, the Center for Khmer Studies, CKS, uh, for um, for hosting this, I really appreciate the uh, the passion and the analytical work done by the panelists, and I want to thank them for uh, giving us these wonderful presentations. And I look forward to seeing in the future uh, more of the research as it as it evolves. Uh, and I uh, want to uh, thank uh, thank everyone. I want to also thank all, all of our staff at the Center for Khmer Studies who do a wonderful job of hosting. Uh, and technically organizing these uh, webinars. And I hope that in the not too distant future, we'll have another, another webinar from the Build for People project as we see uh, this analytical work uh, come, into, uh, come into play in multiple cities uh, around the world. So thank you all very much. And thank you to all the participants who've spent the last hour and a half with us. I think it was very revelatory, at least for me, a very enriching experience. And uh, I, I do appreciate uh, very much uh, all the panelists and the urban science work that, that you are all doing. So thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the not too distant future. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.